The following is an excerpt from the novel Promo Cowboy by Barry Fitzsimmons, read by the author. Chapter 14. Late morning it is. Joe and me have got a full head of steam on our next set of spots for that TV station launch. Only I'm vexed by a couple things. First, the promo copy. Maybe Belinda's marketing plan's tighter than a mosquito's bunghole, only these scripts sure ain't. I'd make a suggestion or two to fix them, only that's a mighty sensitive area to cut into. Once a script gets the VP sign off, it's best considered cast in stone. Second, how we're going to tie all these promo parts together so they equal one voice, one message, one brand. Folks might not know it, but promos are what show and tell viewers what a channel stands for deep down. These cable startups mostly get launched with just a framework of shows, personalities, ideas, like a fresh built house with the outside done but nothing finished on the inside. It's the promos that give the channel its identity and make it a destination. Way I see it, a startup ought to be creative and bold, make a stand and stick with it. Whether it's a frivolous thing like pop music, or a high-minded thing like classic movies, or an important thing like news and politics, you go with the brand you built, and you grow your audience on a quality product, and you don't fret over which way the wind blows, it'll change direction sooner or later. Another thing, don't listen too much to them folks in research, who with their gumption and talent for number crunching might have helped find a cure for cancer, only instead they got their hand in yet another slate of reality shows. Ask me, a TV brand looks plain foolish when they go changing to something totally different, manufacturing bogus taglines and trademark names, using words that don't exist, taking hard right and left turns every year or so till they ain't got the slightest resemblance to what they was when they launched, all in hopes of another tenth of a point. Them kind of channels ain't worth their own salt. Got one more concern I do, about a thing I did last night. Awful brash it was. And when that phone rings in the edit room, bleep bleep, I pick it up and my voice breaks some. Sure enough, that woman on the other end says, well, cowboy, how are we feeling this morning? See, the night before, after I had me a few smokes under that awning, instead of going home like I maybe should have, I pulled that pass and showed it to that security detail. Then I double timed it up that escalator and crossed that mezzanine all the way back to Belinda's office. Place was deserted. Her door was closed. Them shades was all drawn against the windows, too. Thought maybe she and Willie had slipped out. Then I listened for a beat, and I heard Belinda's laugh, big and hearty, so I made a swallow, took off my hat even, and I knocked on that door. Sure enough, that laughter died in a snap, and that door opened, and there was Willie, looking full of himself like always. Over his shoulder, I saw Belinda at her desk, right where I left her, and laid out in front of her was the dregs of that sushi supper Willie brought. Cowboy, she said, accusatory-like, you startled us. I held that hat in my hands. Sorry, ma'am. Don't mean to take up much of your time, only I've been thinking, and I wanted to check back about that business you and me talked over earlier tonight. Remember it? Of course, she said, all soft-like. That offer, still on the table, is it? I mean, I fumbled with my hat, looking down. Can I switch my answer to a yes, if it ain't too late, that is? Belinda looked at her watch and made a face. Hmm... You came in just under the wire, cowboy, so yes, you can switch your answer. She right then made her little coo. This is great news. Let's iron out the details in the morning, okay? Okay, I said, and I donned my hat again. Willie looked hangdog all right, like he didn't have no idea what Belinda and me was up to. Just about to duck out I was when I caught sight of a pair of legs at the far end of that sofa, across from Belinda's desk. Will's shoulder was blocking my view, so I leaned in some, and I tipped my hat to a young woman who was awful pretty, only she looked, I don't know, confused, out of place like. Thought she was maybe one of Willie's young charges, only she didn't look the part. Anyhow, he stepped up in a proprietary fashion, came at me, he did, with fire in his eyes, and I don't never trouble with a man who looks like that. You all have a fine evening, I said, and I lit on out of there. Thing is, 
The sun's up now, and I'm feeling a whirly gig of a hangover, even though I ain't had no drinks for two whole days. Meantime, Belinda's saying into that phone, You don't sound so good, cowboy. Feeling sick? No, ma'am. No regrets about last night. <clears throat> Not at all, I say, covering the truth best I can. How about yourself? Actually, not a good morning for me either. Something about last night's dinner. The food or the company? A little of both. The worst is over, I think. I picture Willie in his darn sushi bag. Guess I hope his little plan died on the vine. Of course, I ain't proud of the fact. Are you ready to talk about the next step? About that job, I say. Belinda draws out her voice in a girlish manner. Uh-huh. I am, and I'm awful thankful for you giving me the chance to think it out. That is, for Willie. I checked myself, only it's too late. Speaking of Willie, something tells me you saw him last night, before you came back to my office. I suck in some air. Truth is, ma'am, him and me had some words. I staggered those meetings so you wouldn't run into each other. Did you see him on the street? Not quite. See, thing is... I look over at Joe. He's got his arm stretched out like he's adjusting a knob on the far end of his console, only he's frozen like a rock formation, and I can tell he's listening in. It don't matter where I seen Willie, I say, only he told me some things. Things, huh? I can imagine. I hear that woman take a breath. Did he tell you about us? He mentioned some personal business from a long time ago. Belinda lets out a big huff. Okay, we need to clear the air. You and him? Me and you. That ain't necessary, Belinda. All your history with Willie don't make no never mind to me. I look at Joe one more time. He's still got his hand on that knob, and it still ain't moved. You need to know a few more things. The truth about Willie. I make a face, only she can't see it. You say so, ma'am. Let's have dinner. Or, wait, I have an idea. Her voice brightens. There's a place I haven't been to since... I hope it's still there. Tell you what, wait for a call from me. She makes a little giggle. Or Modest John. You like that nickname I give to him, ma'am? I do. Ta-ta, cowboy. I hang up that phone and I lean back. And there's a moment where I ain't got no needs nor wants. Where just being's good enough. Savor that moment, I do. Revel in it, even. Only, who busts through that edit room door right then, coming to a halt only inches from my face, like he's doing it on cue? Who but Willie Schubermiller.